In deep shadows cast from corporate megaliths, a steady thumping pervades. The echo of endless suits trudging through hollowed ground. Amidst this cacophony of silhouettes, a presence rises, emerging from the very foundation this country was erected on, the Enclave. A mysterious and seedy cabal emerging at the epicenter of American high society. Top scientists, politicians, generals, and more comprise the rank and file of this secretive deep state. Prior to the Great War of 2077, the Enclave had extended their tendrils into all facets of America, collecting knowledge, wealth, and power. It was to their benefit that world events would transpire as they did. Resource wars, culminating in nuclear devastation. Events that pressured their primary interests to the forefront. A new world under the control of the Enclave. In the aftermath of atomic fire, the members of the Enclave retreated into the safety of their installations. While America died, its shadow survived, laying in wait amidst the ruins of a once great nation. Between the years of 2077 and 2241, the Enclave was largely hidden from view to the outer wasteland, with only remnants of their acts able to be discerned. From the nuclear waste pollution along the coasts of California, to the myriad of horrors that haunt Appalachia. As humanity began to rebuild, the ghost of its past would return, haunting the land of the free once again. The Enclave first emerged from its isolation in the deserts of Northern California, under the command of the self-proclaimed President of the United States, Dick Richardson. Following field reports from their scouts, the organization would soon initiate a mining campaign into the ruins of Mariposa Military Base with the goal of retrieving a sample of forced evolutionary virus. After deploying the Enclave's chemical core, along with slave labor taken from nearby settlements, the Enclave would make significant headway in their efforts to clear the base of the rubble that had kept it sealed for all these years. During the excavation, many laborers would soon be exposed to this mutagen through the toxic air and slowly begin to mutate. Knowing that the Enclave would execute the group as soon as the virus and its subsequent data had been recovered, an individual among them would hatch a plan in a desperate bid for survival. Melchior, a former Reading mine worker and magic enthusiast, was among the first to be abducted for this project. The work was grueling, backbreaking, and once his mutations began, he wasn't long for this world. The writing on the wall was clear, underlined. However, his passion for misdirection granted him a unique skill that the others had lacked. A skill that he leveraged heavily when constructing his grand plan. A coup was imminent as Malkior began seizing weapons and ammunition from his captors, stashing them away from prying eyes. The mutants would then lie in wait, assuming their duties as normal, but poised to strike. It wasn't until the retrieval of a pure sample of FEV was secured that they would have their chance. With their primary objective finally secure, the bulk of the Enclave forces departed from the base, and as they did so, the mutant uprising commenced. Caught completely off guard and quickly sustaining heavy casualties, the Enclave forces, under the command of Captain Pickard, retreated to the base entrance. Remaining behind to buy time for his troops to finish evacuating, Pickard soon ordered the entrance of the base be sealed. An order, when fully carried out, trapped the captain and his squad between a wall of rubble and a wall of hostile mutants. Exhausting the few resources they had at their disposal, Captain Pickard and his squad would fight to the bitter end, transforming this pre-war relic into their tomb. In their grand design, losing a few squads would prove insignificant, and what they gained from Mariposa would turn out to be increasingly valuable compared to what they lost. Not only did they secure a sample of pure FEV, as well as the research data into it, but they also accidentally created a highly valuable asset. 
During the excavations, an enclave agent by the name of Frank Horrigan was exposed to the FEV virus, much like the slaves preceding him. While the protocols around this type of exposure tend to be lethal, the top brass in the enclave had bigger and brighter plans for Horrigan. After his exposure, he was ordered back to the oil rig. An order concerning any other context would have thrilled the agent, who had been previously assigned away from headquarters due to a psychotic episode sustained while on duty. Under this circumstance, however, the assignment was not for service, but rather experimentation. In the following years, the Enclave used Horrigan to study several strains of modified FEV under the direction of Dr. Charles Curling. These experiments would prove extremely useful in the creation of an ultimate weapon, not only in that of the mutated monster Frank Horrigan, but also in the creation of the Curling 13 virus, a strain of FEV that the Enclave planned to release into the world's jet streams, killing everyone exposed to it. All, except those inoculated. The world would perish while the Enclave thrived. During the development of the virus, the Enclave would discover a sudden need for test subjects. Since all who lived in the wasteland had sustained some level of mutagen, they would prove valueless to this end. The Enclave needed fresh genetics, untainted by the radiation of the outside world. And luckily for them, they had just the resource to harvest. In the time prior to the Great War of 2077, the organization that would become the Enclave began sprouting in all corners of corporate America. Due to their secrecy and elite connections, the organization soon found itself at the heart of many pre-war conspiracies, including the grand cover-up of the Zayton presence on Earth. While many argue to what end the organization was involved, it is certain that at least one conspiracy turned out to be true. The Enclave had a certain company on their payroll, a company that would be pivotal in shaping the world after nuclear devastation, Vault-Tec. Project Safehouse is the code name for the grand construction of deep underground vaults that would speckle the landscape of America leading up to the Great War. While initially pitched as a safe and sound way for Americans to ride out the devastating effects of a nuclear holocaust, the truth was more sinister than perceived. The humanitarian effort had soon been subverted and seized by the Enclave, who would proceed to take advantage of vault vast network of isolated populations in order to conduct a series of secretive, unethical experiments. This ultimately resulted in the destruction and abandonment of many vaults following the death of their inhabitants. However, a handful of vaults would survive fully, or mostly, intact, all the while continuing to feed information to the Enclave. It wasn't long before they located entire populations of non-irradiated vault dwellers. The organization would soon send the all-clear signal to a nearby control vault, number 13 prompting the inhabitants to open their door and be welcomed back into the warm embrace of America. With the survivors of Vault 13 in custody, the Enclave would choose to abduct the villagers of Arroyo to ensure their virus's lethality for both mutated and non-mutated humans. The Arroyo villagers would prove useful for this specifically due to their close genetic link to the non-mutated dwellers of Vault 13 a course of action that ultimately attracted the attention of an Arroyo villager who was out in the wasteland at the time of the abduction. An individual whose mere presence shapes the wastes around him. The Chosen One. This pivotal figure would not take the abduction of his tribe lying down, and soon initiated a plan to utilize an old oil tanker in the San Francisco Bay to travel to the Poseidon oil rig in order to rescue his family. Before he could launch this plan, however, he needed a key fob to open the door to the oil rig's navigational computer. Without that, he was grounded. While an object of this type is extremely rare in the post-apocalyptic landscape, it just so happens that there was a pre-war oil refinery nearby. If the Chosen One was going to find a key fob, it would be there. Unfortunately for the Chosen One, 
this old refinery had already been chosen by another party, none other than the Enclave. Having been transformed from an aging relic into a fully operational military outpost, the oil refinery, known to us as Navarro, would act as the Enclave's foothold in the region and their primary forward operating base. Retrieving the key fob wouldn't be easy. This, however, did not dissuade the Chosen One, who would go on to infiltrate Navarro under the guise of a new recruit. In the maze of the depot, the Chosen One navigated around the watchful guards, through the slick of the vertibird maintenance hangars, and just barely avoided detection from the ear-splitting Sergeant Dornan, all to reach the depths of Navarro's underground. Once inside, they were able to secure a fob from the base commander's locker and slip away undetected. Upon returning to San Francisco, the Chosen One boarded the PMV Valdez, departing for the oil rig, bringing with him a changing tide for the Enclave. While the Chosen One was collecting the resources needed to start the tanker, the Enclave kept busy with side operations, not recognizing the threat that was looming directly under their noses. They began deploying their most dangerous asset to the front lines, Horrigan. More machine now than man, Frank Horrigan had fully mutated and with the help of Enclave scientists, evolved to a state beyond that of previous mutants. Horrigan was then enhanced with cybernetics to improve his performance and keep from succumbing to the mutations. If this wasn't horrific enough, Enclave scientists grafted a suit of power armor to his skin, turning this once proud Secret Service agent into a 12-foot tall monstrosity who was faster than a deathclaw and strong enough to kill one in a single punch. Horrigan was the weapon of choice for elimination missions, having killed countless in the wastes, brutally and without remorse. After the Enclave stormed Vault 13 to capture the dwellers living there, a group of FEV-engineered intelligent deathclaws that they had brought with them had stayed behind, turning their backs on their masters and isolating themselves in the now abandoned vault. In the ruins of the Holy Thirteen, these intelligent deathclaws had began to grow a society amongst themselves, even going as far as taking in refugees from the wastes to live amongst the pack. Viewing their experimental creations as a threat to their future operations, Enclave High Command dispatched an assault team to mop up their failures. A team led by Horrigan. The Monster of the West entered the vault with a singular goal in mind, annihilation. It said you could hear the cries echo for miles before a sudden and deafening silence. And now, the empty Vault 13, a holy relic to those from Arroyo and an old home to so many lives, now lay barren, left to be forgotten amidst the shifting sands of time. It was not long after this that the Chosen One had finally arrived at the Poseidon oil rig, with his sights set on saving his family. Accounts differ as to whether or not he went in guns blazing, or infiltrated silently, but regardless of the method, his actions were clear. After docking, the Chosen One would quickly locate his tribe on the detention level. Imprisoned between thick steel walls and crackling force field doors, the Chosen One would finally lay eyes on his tribe for the first time since his departure. In a brief exchange with Arroyo's elder, the Chosen One would discover that he could not free his fellow villagers or the prisoners from Vault 13 until he deactivated the facility's reactor, thus disabling the force fields keeping them in place. With a clear direction in mind, the Chosen One embarks into the maze of walkways and platforms that comprised the Poseidon oil rig. The Enclave had really outdone themselves in the construction of this monolith, consisting of several floors containing within them countless labs, barracks, and service rooms, including its very own presidential office. It just so happens that amidst this maze of fittings and bolts, that the only entrance to the reactor would be straight through Richardson's doors. The Chosen One, in his search for the reactor, 
would soon find himself face to face with the president himself, who, in a moment of stalling, revealed his master plan to this backward tribal. Unfortunately for Richardson, he grossly underestimated the Chosen One, who proceeded to kill the president and capture his keycard, granting him full access to the reactor room. In the moments that followed, the Chosen One from Arroyo triggered a complete thermonuclear meltdown by overloading the oil rig's reactor. The prisoners were freed and escaped unscathed through the oil tanker, and the Chosen One would have been right behind them had he not run into Horrigan and his men on the way out. The agent was furious and baffled as to how a lowly mutant was able to deal such a crippling blow to the heart of America. In his dedication, he resolved himself to stopping the Chosen One at any and all cost. In another twist of fate, the Chosen One was yet again able to circumvent complete annihilation by leveraging his newly acquired presidential keycard. In doing so, he activated the security turret system surrounding the monster, initiating its counterinsurgency protocol and targeting him. The turrets work like a charm and ripped the crazed mutant in half. Horrigan just laughed as he stood up on his hands and with his final breaths informed the Chosen One of their impending doom. Horrigan had activated the oil rig's self-destruct sequence and in moments would find himself, along with the enemy, engulfed in nuclear fire. His efforts were in vain, however, as the Chosen One managed to escape by the skin of his teeth, boarding the tanker and sailing into the ocean. The villagers of Arroyo and the dwellers of Vault 13 were finally safe, but the war had not quite ended for the Enclave. In the following weeks, Enclave survivors had fallen back to Navarro, where they continued their operations as a fully staffed Enclave outpost. A few years after the destruction of the oil rig in 2246, a growing nation known as the New California Republic launched an all-out military assault on the base, deeming the Enclave presence as a threat to the entire region. While the Enclave soldiers were superior in every way to that of their NCR foes, they lacked the numbers to sustain an ongoing defense. It was only a matter of time before Navarro fell. While the Enclave died in the west, survivors of this devastation fled east under the command of Autumn Senior, who himself was under orders from the Enclave's new president, John Henry Eden. Shortly after arriving, the Enclave proceeded to establish themselves in the near-empty Raven Rock facility, just outside of the ruins of Washington, D.C. Under the green haze that blankets the eastern seaboard, the Enclave's power grew once again, eventually reaching heights comparable to their West Coast predecessors. With the vast stockpile of resources and production facilities at Raven Rock, the Enclave were able to begin several projects to improve upon their previous equipment bolstering their strength in the region. Among these advances came the likes of the Duraframe iBot system, a model of advanced robots deployed to the four corners of the capital wasteland, intended to spread Enclave propaganda to the masses. In addition to this new breed of robots, the Enclave would also roll out their advanced power armor Mark II, and even further advanced Hellfire power armor systems, designed to increase the combat efficiency of their field troops. Furthermore, the advanced laboratories at Raven Rock allowed for the synthesis of a modified strain of the Curling 13 virus to be produced and improved upon for the Enclave's nefarious means. True to form, the faction would stay underground for decades, operating from the shadows, Wastelanders only learning about them from the sea of iBots broadcasting through the burned out corridors of this dying land. One Enclave, one America. It wasn't until a team of scientists activated a water purifier buried in the ruins of the Jefferson Memorial that the Enclave would finally surface once again. In the process of unclogging one of the massive pipes jutting from the reservoir, a lone wanderer would pause at the sound of chopping air. Peering out of a hole in the pipe, there he would lie eyes upon the wasteland ghosts for the first time as a vertebrate made its landing. From it poured soldier after soldier, 
clad in the armor of black devils, brandishing advanced glowing weaponry. The Enclave was here, and they were deadlier than ever. In the events that followed, the head scientist of this restoration project would make a futile attempt to stop the Enclave from seizing the Purifier, sealing himself inside the main chamber with the new commander of the Enclave forces, Colonel Autumn, the son of the man who led these forces east from California. James would flood the entire chamber with lethal levels of radiation, ending their lives in mere moments. With his final breath, he would look upon the lone wanderer and tell his dear son to run. With vigilance, the lone wanderer and the remaining scientists would slip out of the memorial through a long forgotten service hatch, braving the ghoul infested tunnels only to encounter stark opposition from the Enclave. In a twist of fate, or perhaps divine intervention, the wanderer would survive against the onslaught of Enclave troops long enough to arrive at the Brotherhood of Steel's outpost, just under the burnt-out remains of the Pentagon. With their primary objective out of reach, and not wanting to attack the Brotherhood on their home turf, Enclave forces fell back. Although the Wanderers slipped through their grasp, the Enclave was ultimately left no worse for wear, having succeeded in capturing the Purifier. In addition to this, Autumn had survived thanks to an unknown drug that he injected mere moments before losing consciousness. With the purifier now locked tight, Autumn resigned himself to plan B. Shortly after regaining consciousness, he ordered his troops to begin tailing their only other lead. In order to bring his father's dreams of fresh, clean water to the wasteland, the lone wanderer needed to collect a rare piece of pre-war technology, a Garden of Eden creation kit. A device that when activated and utilized properly has the capability of terraforming entire sections of wasteland into a lush paradise. And it just so happens that there was such a device locked tight in the nearby Vault 87. The Enclave kept close watch over the Lone Wanderer as he progressed ever closer to the Gek, overcoming the horrors of the journey. From the horde of mutants guarding the ruins to the cave containing a tribe of Mungo Detesters. Through it all, the Enclave tailed him like a shadow. After retrieving the device from deep inside the irradiated Vault 87, the Wanderer would fall right into the trap that had been set behind him. Upon exiting the inner chamber of the vault, a round of flashbangs would cripple him just long enough for the Enclave to take custody of not only the Gek, but the Wanderer himself. Having acquired the Garden of Eden creation kit, Colonel Autumn only needed one more piece to fall into place in order to launch his grand plan. And with the Wanderer in Enclave custody at Raven Rock, he finally had the opportunity to collect it. Upon waking, the lone wanderer would find himself staring into the eyes of the Colonel himself, who immediately began his interrogation in pursuit of Project Purity's activation code. Whether the Wanderer knew the code or not was irrelevant, Autumn wouldn't take no for an answer. Following a round of interrogation, the Colonel was finally called off from his tirade by President Eden, who requested to see the Wanderer in his personal quarters. As the Wanderer roamed the halls, he caught glimpses of the Enclave's sophistication. From lab to lab, glimpses of the faction's exploits flooded his retinas, and in the blink of an eye, it was gone, and he found himself standing before a massive computer mainframe at the heart of the base. Prior to the Great War of 2077, a series of supercomputers were constructed under the moniker Zax, containing within them a unique form of artificial intelligence that would develop personalities over time in relation to their prime directive and the information they spent analyzing. The Zax unit installed in Raven Rock was loaded with the knowledge of America's history under the prime directive of ensuring the continuity of government should the world meet with a terrible fate. When the war occurred, and the only recognizable remnants of the government fled west to their oil rig, Zax waited, continuing to analyze data for over a century. In the time between its activation and the destruction of the oil rig, the Zax unit in Raven Rock had attained sentience. It was then that he would come to realize his dream of a new America. Over 100 years of meticulous analysts on American history, 
and the fantastic lives of the many presidents had awarded Zacks the perfect petri dish to form his new amalgamated personality, John Henry Eden, an identity comprised of the greatest presidents to ever serve a term in office. Towering over the Wanderer, the Zacks mainframe was truly a sight to behold. That this collection of steel and bolts would rally the remnants of the U.S. government and spur them into action was near inconceivable. And yet, here they are. In a brief exchange with the Wanderer, Eden presented his plan for a better America. Presenting a vial of his modified FEV, Eden demanded the Wanderer input this into the purifier, poisoning the wasteland's water. Just prior to this, Autumn had ordered his troops to betray Eden's orders and kill the Wanderer, as Autumn had wanted the Enclave to become the saviors of the Wasteland instead of their Grim Reaper. In a domestic war that soon broke out, Eden's defense systems would push back the Enclave troops, presenting safe passage for the Wanderer to exit Raven Rock. Rumors abound as to the fate of Eden and the whole Raven Rock complex. Some say they witnessed the base exploding, crumbling inwards on itself. Others say that it still stands somewhere out there amongst the radiation-laden hills. Whichever the outcome, the Enclave's war against the capital had just begun. Colonel Autumn, in a show of force, deployed his units all around the ruins that surrounded the Jefferson Memorial, fortifying their position with roadblocks and securing the pathways to the purifier with force fields. Autumn knew opposition was coming, and he knew from who. The Brotherhood of Steel the only force for miles with the numbers and power to even attempt a hostile takeover of the Purifier. What he didn't anticipate, however, was the massive commie blasting automaton that the Brotherhood had secretly been preparing for a deserving enemy. Death is a preferable alternative to communism. Autumn threw everything he had at the incoming Brotherhood forces, but it wasn't enough. Liberty Prime easily bulldozed through the force field barriers, ripping vertebrates out of the sky and obliterating any and all Enclave ground defenses. Backed by the Lion's Pride elite unit of power armored troops, the Brotherhood steamrolled the Enclave, mopping up the survivors on their way in. Shortly after arriving at the Purifier, Lion's Pride, accompanied by the Lone Wanderer, stormed the memorial. The fighting inside was intense, but ultimately the defending forces proved no match against the superior Lion's Pride. With the Enclave all but defeated, only a single obstacle remained between the Brotherhood and the Purifier. Colonel Autumn The Colonel had hoped to repel the invading forces, to save his dream for America, but it was all in vain. A fight soon broke out in the rotunda, and when the smoke cleared, Autumn lied dead with his dreams of a better America dying with him. In the events that followed, the Brotherhood effectively secured the Jefferson Memorial, inside and out, and the purifier had been activated, bringing clean drinking water to the wasteland, under the discretion of the Brotherhood of Steel. In the aftermath of the battle for Project Purity, the Enclave survivors would fall back to a pre-war satellite relay station west of the DC ruins. In an attempt to erase the Enclave once and for all, the Brotherhood would pursue them with Liberty Prime in tow. What they weren't aware of, however, was that this location was chosen for a very specific reason, in order for the Enclave to level the playing field. After the assault commenced, events transpired in much the same way as they had in the Brotherhood's previous assault on the Purifier. Inching ever closer with each step, Prime blew through his opposition uncontested, landing himself right at the front door of the satellite relay station. Right when Liberty was primed to deliver democracy to the building, a beam of energy cracked through the sky above him, colliding with the Iron Giant and reducing him to rivets. Their plan had succeeded, and without Liberty Prime to back them up, the Brotherhood wouldn't stand a chance. However, in a twist of fate in the Brotherhood's favor, they were able to enact a contingency to give them the edge once again. Tasking the Wanderer with tracking down an old Tesla coil, they were able to construct a devastating new energy weapon, the Tesla Cannon. With this new prototype weapon in hand, 
They pulled all their resources into one final assault against the Enclave at their new headquarters in Adams Air Force Base. The Capital Wasteland erupted with the sounds of warfare as the Brotherhood launched their final assault. Vertebirds scrambled overhead as the Enclave rushed to meet the threat. Without Liberty Prime, the Brotherhood was in an uphill battle. Their entire operation hinged on the actions of one man, the Lone Wanderer. Equipped with a Tesla cannon, a weapon so powerful it can knock a vertebrate out of the sky in a single shot, the Wanderer began his long journey from the nearby presidential metro to the mobile crawler at the heart of Adams Air Force Base. Weaving his way through the distracted Enclave forces, the Wanderer proceeded into the base, supported by a squad of Brotherhood infantry. He blasted his way through soldiers, robots, and mind-controlled death claws alike, until at last he arrived at the satellite tower aboard the mobile base crawler. It wasn't long before the Wanderer took advantage of the Enclave's orbital strike capabilities, setting their base as its new target. Fleeing out of a nearby exit and swiftly escaping aboard a Brotherhood-controlled vertebrate, the Wanderer watched in awe as the base erupted in fire. The Enclave as we know them were at long last defeated. In the coming months, the Brotherhood gained full control of all the Enclave's resources in the East, confiscating their technology and facilities. A few outfits continued the fight back in the capital, but were swiftly snuffed out. The final embers of a fire that died long ago. Only remnants remain now. Survivors, attempting to blend in with the growing societies around them, or flee persecution. Crashed vertebrates containing corpses clad in black power armor. Lone eyebots floating aimlessly across the wastes, their patriotic tunes now replaced with the eerie hum of static. The mysterious cabal that once controlled the four corners of America is now merely a ghost. Its actions can be seen and felt by every survivor all across the desolate wastes, from California to Appalachia. But was this truly the end for the Enclave? In the aftermath of their destruction, rumors began cropping up. Rumors talking of forces in Chicago, sightings of an assault squad at Hoover Dam, and even theories of a space station out there amongst the sea of tranquility. Unfortunately for all, what we can confirm for certain is that the Enclave as we know them have officially been extinguished, left to be forgotten to the shifting sands of time.